And welcome to Irvine United Congregational Church. I can't believe it's already the second Sunday of Lent, but I'm so glad that you are here with us and thankful that we can gather in this way. IUCC is a proud, progressive Christian congregation of the United Church of Christ, and we are an open and affirming, just peace, creation, justice, global missions church, which means that we are committed to working for justice in our world and intentionally welcome the LGBT community among us as we live, work, and share our love as a community of faith. If it is your first time with us, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I know you have a lot of options online and it's wonderful that you've stopped by. You can learn a little bit more about our progressive church by going to our website, and if you'll go to iucc.org slash visitor, you can tell us a little bit about you, and we'll be happy to reach out and welcome you into our community. I also want to intentionally invite you to join us at our coffee hour after both of our services on Zoom. They'll put the link up now, but it's such a great time to get to know one another, and we want to be especially inviting to those of you who may have just stumbled upon our church or have been watching us online for some time but haven't had the opportunity to connect with us in person. So if it's your first time or the first few times, we hope that you'll join us. And of course, all you regular IUCC family members are welcome to join us there as well. You can all help us to get the word out about our congregation and our progressive church by simply sharing on your Facebook page right now. If you're watching, just push the share button, and that'll help to share the good news about our church. As we always say, it's personal recommendations that really make a difference. So you can do that so easily. And when you do that, you actually help our Google Analytics go up and help those folks who are looking for a progressive Christian church to find us. So we are just about a week and a half into our Lenten journey, our journey inside. It's quite obviously, as we said, taking place inside our homes. But in reality, this journey inside is an inward journey, one that we can visualize in the symbol of a labyrinth and the act of walking it. A labyrinth is not a maze, it follows a path, always circling its way inward, inviting us to do the same. Step by step, thought by thought, prayer by prayer. I have this finger labyrinth here, and I can use it to follow along and quiet my mind as I go inward in my thoughts. You don't need to go this fast, you can actually go slowly and thoughtfully. And we also have the opportunity for you to do a finger labyrinth as well, simply by downloading it from our website or from our weekly message. And you can print it out, or you can actually do it on your phone. And what's so exciting is that right before me, where your chairs are usually sitting, is an incredible labyrinth created by Robin Marie McClement with love. It's even in the shape of a heart. And you're invited to come and walk the labyrinth anytime between 10 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Monday through Thursday. If you'll give us a call ahead of time or an email, you can actually schedule it. Uh, but we want to make sure that only one household at a time is present. I think you'll find this to be an encouraging practice to put our minds in a space that we can fully experience this inward journey during the season of Lent. So I want to thank you once more for joining us. I hope that you'll find this service to be inspirational, thoughtful, prayer-filled, and alive with the Spirit. Welcome to IUCC. We 
are a wilderness wandering people on a journey of the soul. May we find our destination in our longing to behold. Our holy God is calling to us with Jesus by our side. May compassion be our compass. May the Spirit be our guide. We belong. We belong. We belong. Sojourners of faith, we continue along our Lenten path pausing to reflect upon the milestones that brought us here. The spirit among us, we wander. Into the light, we continue. Shine, O light of love, shine among us. Onward and inward, with Jesus as our guide, the journey inside continues. Here are some fun facts. Some fun facts. Some fun facts. Some fun facts about light. Light is very, 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 very fast. Light is always on the move. Light is always on the move. Always on the move. Always on the move. Light makes it possible for us to see colors. Light can be split to give a range of colors. Light. Red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, and violet. Light gives energy. Light gives energy. Light gives energy. Light gives energy. Light gives warmth. Light gives warmth. Light gives warmth. Light helps us see. Light helps us see. Light helps us see. Light helps things grow. Light helps things grow. Light helps things grow. We are the light of the world. 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 What will you do? 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 To let your light shine. To let your light shine. To let it shine. To let your light shine. To let your light shine. What will you do when you make your life This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine 
We enter into this time of prayer, as always, so aware of the pain in our world, just as we hold this tension of hope and joy while we recognize the suffering among us. This is our Christian task, after all, to see the pain and suffering of our world, to feel it in solidarity, and yet also not be so weighed down by it that we cannot recognize the hope and joy among us. I'm so grateful, particularly because those in our congregation have been able to get the vaccine, but every time I see someone post about getting a vaccine, my heart just leaps with joy knowing that they are that much safer and we as a community are as well. So I hold this joy and hope even as we know the reality that our country has now hit nearly 510,000 American deaths, and with that, friends and family who are grieving the loss of their beloved. This pandemic has hit our country hard, in fact, as it has hit our world. And this is one that has taken more lives than all of our nation's wars combined. This battle, and we have not yet won it. Devastated by the casualties, we enter into this time aware, mindful, recognizing the effects upon each of us, those who have been infected, but all of us affected. And so we enter this time aware of our grief and hopeful, knowing that our God is with us. So I will say the names on our prayer list and invite you to share a name aloud or write it in the comments so we can share with you. And then as our prayer concludes, we'll end with Jesus' words as we say his prayer together. Let us pray. God of the journey, you invite us inward to connect more fully to you, to experience you now, illuminating our path, guiding us from the outside in and the inside out. You know us fully, our hopes and our dreams, our worries and our fears. You know the weight that we carry the isolation of these days, our longing to connect out 
and in. And so we pause. We breathe. We journey. And we acknowledge all that we are carrying with us along our way. Holy One, hear the prayers of your people. We lift up Daniel Blackburn's grandparents, Barbara Carse's cousin, Kim, David Cottle, Hallie Cisperes Corrine's husband, Javier, Judy Curry, her family, and her husband, Mike, Alyssa Cornett's parents and her grandmother, Grace, Ellery Einstein, the family and friends who mourn Sandra Fox, Worth Giller, the family and friends of John Habash's friend Joe and his grieving partner Veronica. Linda and Chuck Heath's neighbor Mark and his son Andy. Joan Henderson, Terry and Eric Houston, Janice Johnson, Jen Lofstrom and her mother, Angie Lucas, Sharon Lynn's friend Nan, Jen Mermack's cousin Amy, Cheryl Moore, Mary and Craig Rep's daughter Anna and their new grandbaby, Marjorie Robertson's brother Sean, Matt Royster's grandson, Ruth Sandberg's sister in law Mary and her sons David and Eric, Susan Sayers' sister Patty, Dave Schofield's friend Kate, David Schwarm, and all who grieve the death of his father-in-law, John Cody Vaquila, Marilyn Smith, Jean Stewart's sister Carol, Jeff Struckhart's sister-in-law Kay, Todd Thompson, Dale Vaughn, Jan Wilson. You know our hearts, the depth of our souls, the prayers that we say out loud, and those that we Hold deep inside. Hold us in the light of your love that we might carry that light back out into the world. We follow along the path of the one who shared his light and illuminates our way. His prayer alive upon our lips, we pray. Our creator, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so it is that we extend our prayers beyond this moment into the life of our service and beyond into the lives that we live as we give of ourselves this morning we consider the great gift of life that we have been given we give ourselves to our church committing ourselves to journey this path together even as we each walk it our own way so let us give today with generous hearts and a commitment to be church.
Holy God, we thank you for these gifts and for the people who give them with such generosity of heart. Together we journey your path, mindful that you invite us deeper into relationship with you and one another, grateful to give of ourselves and be your church a light into the world. Amen. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. I can't go to sleep. I won't. I'm sorry, but it's time for bed. You've had your story. You've had your song. Now it's time to sleep. No, I can't yet. I'm not tired. Let's talk about God. Hmm. A conversation she knows I love having, but I recognize it as a diversionary tactic. God wants you to go to sleep. But it's too dark. I can't go to sleep. I'm all alone here. You're not all alone. We're here. We're right downstairs. But I'm afraid of the dark. Turn on your star belly and I'll turn on the nightlight. That should be more than enough to help you sleep. Well, she wasn't happy about it, but she knew she was safe. She could see the light, both from the nightlight on the wall and her stuffed animal that shines light from its belly. And she knew she wasn't alone. Of course, I really don't blame her. It can be scary when you can't see. I've woken up in the middle of the night before, a strange noise frightening me, squinting in the darkness, unable to see, shadows looming, heart pounding. The first thing I want to do is turn on the lights. And somehow, I feel better. The light literally casts out darkness. And somehow, it also casts out fears. Well, we all know this has been a heavy, scary year. We've all been fearful, and with good reason. The virus is even scarier than monsters under the bed. So then, it seems appropriate that we look for the light and intentionally bring it into our lives, and in this case, our altar. Now, our altar here at church always has candles, two of them, burning to remind us of the presence of the Spirit. So since we are on a journey inside, I invite you to bring a candle into your holy space. As part of our Lenten journey, we're practicing the obvious, that we recognize that we are all worshiping at home, as we have for nearly a year. But during this season, we're invited to create an altar or a dedicated holy space that we can go to intentionally and physically. Now, it's not that we need to now go anywhere in order to experience God, but when we create physical space, we allow our minds the opportunity to be present to God with us in a way that feels more tangible. So for this reason, we are creating these altars And we're using physical objects as symbols to guide us deeper along our journey inside. And so here's today's, the light. It's fitting in our journey inside that we have this inside altar. We create this physical space in our home so that we can go to that spiritual place inside. We began the journey, of course, on Ash Wednesday, and we placed the ashes of last year's palms upon our foreheads, reminding us of the impermanence of life and the very gift that we have to live out each day. Truly, life is sacred, and we recognize its sanctity. Then last week, we put a stone, a literal touchstone, to allow us to name the rough and rocky places in our lives, but also to give them to God. 
We remember the way Jesus went out into the wilderness as we go into our wild places, our wilderness, and seek to be sustained by more than just food alone. The search for spiritual sustenance continues as we continue our journey inside. A candle, fire, light, that permits us to see. The flame enlightens, literally, as I said, casting out darkness and figuratively enlightening our minds. When we can see more clearly, we can understand the larger picture and thus understand our place in it. We can ask ourselves, what is it that I need to cast more light upon in my life? Where am I only seeing in part? What shadows are clouding my vision? Of course, when I think of light and fire, my mind immediately goes to Pentecost. I imagine the tongues of fire, the Spirit of God aflame with wisdom. And, and you remember this? That was the precursor, really, to the light bulb over the forehead was the flames hovering just atop their heads and awakening. In the Pentecost story, it is when the flames were above their heads that they could finally understand one another, each in their own languages like the light that clears vision, the flame enlightened them with the ability to connect beyond themselves, which is, of course, a powerful image for us today as we think about how we connect beyond ourselves in a pandemic. So yes, as far as biblical imagery goes, fire and spirit go hand in hand. The writer of the Gospel of John is aflame with light imagery, Beginning in the first chapter of the writer, casts Jesus in as the light of the world, the one who came to shine in the darkness to be the light of our lives. John's Jesus proclaims in chapter 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And it's a beautiful scripture promising us the light if we follow the one light. As John says, that's Jesus. So those of you who have engaged in biblical studies know that each of the Gospels casts Jesus in different lights, pun intended, each portraying him slightly differently. Well, the Gospel of John, as you probably know, is called the Signs Gospel, and so over and over again, we see signs that demonstrate to the reader, to us, that Jesus is the Son of God or the embodiment of God, God in God's self. It's rife with metaphor, which makes it incredibly poetic. And the symbols help us to think about God and Jesus in our lives. It's theologically decidedly different from the Synoptic Gospels, which are the first three Gospels that share a common denominator, which is Mark. Everything in John's Gospel, every story, every miracle is a sign that points to Jesus' identity. Jesus as the Son of God, the Logos, the light. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus does something he rarely does in any other Gospel. Over and over again, he says, I am. He's echoing the name of God, the only name we ever hear in reference to God, I am. When asked, who are you? So in the Gospel of John, we hear Jesus say, I am. And immediately, we can understand this as a theological statement. I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the door of the sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And of course, I am the light of the world. In the Gospel of John, it's all about Jesus. The Christology is what we call high, meaning Jesus is basically God. Whereas if you remember the Gospel of Mark, the Christology is pretty low. The Son of Man isn't necessarily the Son of God. In fact, in Mark, every time someone asks Jesus if he's the Messiah, he evades the question, and then when they make a statement like, I know who you are, Jesus tells them to go away and don't tell anyone. 
from the Gospel of John and the theologies and Christologies that are derived from it, we get a Jesus who does all the work. You remember John 3.16, of course. I like to call it the touchdown scripture <laughs> because there's always somebody holding it up at a sign at a football game so that Jesus can do the work and get their team the touchdown. Because that's the thing. In John's gospel, Jesus does the work, or, or God does, using Jesus as the sacrificial lamb. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I always say it in the King James Version because I memorized it from my grandmother when I was a kid. But it's a good example for us of how in the Gospel of John, it's about believing in Jesus. And for the Gospel of John, all the signs point to Jesus. Jesus will do the work if we just believe because he's the bread of life. He's the way, he's the vine, and he is the light. And Jesus is a light. John's not wrong. The imagery is beautiful. But I think it's worth noting that Matthew's Jesus doesn't say that. In the gospel according to Matthew, it's not I am the light of the world. It's you are the light of the world. See, what Jesus does here is put the onus back on us. It's not about believing in Jesus. In fact, I'd say it's more about believing in ourselves. It's not about Jesus' light. It's about our light. You are the light of the world. What John's gospel reserves for Jesus, Matthew's Jesus puts back on all of us. We are the light. That is a huge responsibility, being light. I think that's why John would prefer it all go to Jesus. I think that's why many Christians would prefer it all be Jesus' problem Jesus can do the work. Shine, Jesus, shine, as the praise song sings. But Jesus' song today isn't actually shine, Jesus, shine. It's you shine. You are the light of the world. Shine brightly. I think Jesus prefers us to sing a little Lenin. We all shine on like the moon and the stars and the sun because Every time we put it on Jesus, Jesus puts it back on us. So, since we are embarking upon this journey inside, our Lenten task is to look for the light. The candle reminds us of God's presence in our world, but it also illuminates a path toward God within us. I imagine our labyrinth path that spirals inward, leading us to the light in us. God's presence in us. You are the light of the world. It makes me think about Molly, my daughter, and her nightly fears. The candle is both the nightlight and her star belly, the stuffed animal. That star belly that illuminates light from the belly that shines out to, in this case, cast these light images upon the ceiling. But I think our lives are kind of like that. We experience God as a light that shines upon us, but we're also like the star belly. These beings that have this light that just emanates from us. So that when we find ourselves in the dark places of our world or the dark night of the soul, the light shines and the darkness shall not overcome it. We're never far from the light because the light is in us. The spirit is within, shining out. It reminds us that God lives in us. And that we have a responsibility to shine our light, to share it with the world. There's no stuffing it back inside, no covering it up with a basket and forcing the oxygen out so the light will be snuffed. There's no hiding it away, no shrinking, no claiming to be small and powerless. If you are the light of the world, the light of the world, you shine. 
You let that light shine with all of its brilliance radiating into dark places, starting within on this journey inside, and then far beyond ourselves as we let our light join with all of the other reflections of the one light that lives in us, around us, and through us. Well, Molly wanted to talk about God, so I guess you can thank her for today's sermon. And should you find yourself like her, afraid of the dark and all the scary things that come with it, look for the light. It's out there. It's in here. And you are never alone. Find the light. Be the light. Carry the light. Amen. We have all witnessed your presence. We have received your grace. We give you honor and glory for moving in this place. Now we go out to share the good news. Now we go out to share your love. Now we go out to share the good news. Now we go out to share. sisters, siblings in Christ, go out into the world broken and hurting, sometimes such a dark and scary place, and look for the light. Find it shining in the night and journey inside to find it there too. Then, carry the light out into the world so that your light might shine before others. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Amen. <laughs>